Again, for those that don't know me, I'm Dr. Steve Wiener. I'm with uh, Steel Agile, Safe Fellow and uh, Principal Consultant. And Stash is actually the chair of this afternoon track intro to the topic. And then he will come and share the three speakers uh, who we have invited to that next. So that looks, Stash, like uh, May Start Away by Eric Reese. Two. Okay, you guys are in for some fun uh, because uh, if you if you know safe at all, you know that over the last couple of years we've really started to learn from and embrace this idea of the things that Eric introduced, whether it's minimum viable product, uh, innovation accounting, pivot or persevere uh, in inter large enterprises, is the startup way kind of that cool story in government and GE and places of. How do we bring intrapreneurialism into large established organizations? So uh, I think that's a very, very relevant topic for our government customer. And we talked about it in the, in the government class this week about how much we need to have that ability in government programs, as you just heard from the speakers this morning, right? to have that option that when, when we know it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a lame duck, let's kill it. When we deliver enough value, let's pivot to something else. Not exactly the way we've been used to working, but it's something that I think be incredibly valuable in the government context. So very excited about this afternoon. Uh, hopefully that sets the stage for what uh, these three presentations will uh, go into more detail about. And with that, Stash, you want to uh, give us who our speakers are and uh, get this thing going? Okay, thanks Steve. So first up is John Rubark. Uh, John has been a career agilist by always challenging the status quo of government operations from his beginnings as a satellite integrator to a government systems engineer and now as the director of strategic operations for his company. John takes an economic view of all activities to ensure the best value to the government is given. His passion for being right has led him to transform government agencies toward improved contracting, acquisition techniques, engineering methods, business rhythms, and most recently, innovation. When he's not saving the world, he's an active father of four beautiful girls and a podcaster in the Million Downloads Club. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Mike, one, two, three, four. Okay, so I'm glad he asked the audience first of who has read or has any familiarity with, with lean startups. So if, Assumes that I'm going to assume that most of you don't. So I had a few slides in the beginning to kind of give an overview of how Lean Startup and Agile work together. Uh, just a little disclosure. Again, I represent myself, not my company nor my government customer. You'll hear me reference NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, a couple of times, uh, but this hasn't gone through their official approval process. So the Lean Startup is a methodology for developing. And businesses or products, comes from the entrepreneurial background, which aims to shorten product development cycles by ad adopting a combination of business hypothesis-driven experimentation, iterative product releases, and validated learning. Uh, another way for the Agilist, I like to say it's Agile on steroids, in the sense that um, you do a lot of customer discovery up front with validated learning. Um, another way that you can relate this to the Agile parlance is what would you do if you were told to develop and you didn't have a product to run? How do you validate what you're building before you, you go off and execute? Um, so one of the methods, there are many methods out there, and what's, what is nice is because it is, it is kind of a framework in the sense of Agile is a framework, that there are methods to do it, but if you keep these principles of lean that we talked about this morning and through a lot of the contracting yesterday, a lot of that will still um, remain. The, way, the method that we use over at NGA is one pioneered by both uh, Eric Reese and Steve Blank. So you hear a lot about uh, Steve Blank and his entrepreneurial uh, background. And so those are two names that we're going to reference a lot here. Steve Blank um, has this lean framework where you start with a, a business model, a business model canvas, and after you lay out not only what you're building for who, but how are you going to sustain it? What's the back end that needs to be there to support it? Um, all of that is just a guess. And then you go off and do customer discovery and customer development 
to make sure you really truly understand the customer. We're not talking about gathering requirements, we're talking about really honestly knowing what the customer needs, sometimes even before they do. And once you have that true validated learning, then you go off and execute it via the agile principles we know love today. Um, so just a little bit more detail on that methodology. Um, for those who haven't seen this, this is uh, a popular tool used in the startup and lead startup community called a business model canvas. Instead of going the traditional MBA route where you, know, you have to do a lot of market research and put together a large business plan and then ask for a lot of money from the bank, here we're distilling pretty much the nine questions that every startup needs to know in a one-page business plan. Okay, so basically you want to know what is your value proposition? For which customer segments are you building that? How are you delivering that, that value to those customers? How are you engaging with your customers to make sure early that you are learning from them and get, giving them what they want? And then how are, the, how are you capturing the revenue? On the left side, how are, how are you, um, what activities do you need? What are key activities that need to occur in order for you to build that product? What are key resources you need? What's the infrastructure required, the human capital required? And if you can't own or control all of those key resources and key activities, who do you need to partner with that can, that can uh, provide the uh, economy of scale or that can do it better than you can so that you can build that product for those customers? And all of those come at a cost. So if you can't answer those nine basic segments, categories of information, you really don't know what you're doing. But when you lay all this out as your first step, of doing lean startup, every one of these things is an unvalidated yes. That's why we have guessed through every one of those um, uh, squares. What do you do next? If you don't know, but you think you have a good idea, go off and find out. The way you do that is you create hypotheses. And when we say hypotheses, we mean it in the literal scientific sense of, if we do this, then we'll see this result. These things need to be fals falsely tr uh, falsifiable in the sense that we can tell, not just cold spaghetti on the wall, uh, we'll try this, we'll try that, we'll try this, we'll try that, and waste a lot of time. And the waste is bad and mean. We want to have hypotheses that will really test customer development. You can see this iteration here on the left of searching for customers, of customer discovery, customer validation, and then, of course, the, the buzzword now, pivoting. Right? Pivoting with data, not pivoting with gut and intuition. That's what we're trying to transform. This, uh, this search away from just um, wasting a lot of time to validate learning. And I was really glad to hear Don Ronston talk about it this morning as this really supports the whole lean product development flow because when you validate up front, it makes you know, executing that much easier. Uh, for those who are familiar with lean, it's really all about Gemma, going to the floor, going to the factory floor, seeing where the work is done, truly understanding your customer. Right? Um, Steve Blank, one of his favorite, favorite catchphrases is, um, there are no facts in the ivory tower, get out and build it. Right? You have to get out and talk to customers and as many as possible. In fact, when he teaches um, this to Stanford and other, um, other colleges, he requires that his students, who already have a full course load, interview 10 to 15 potential customers per week. So in a 10-week course, you have over 100, 125 potential customers that can validate or invalidate your good ideas that you put in that business model campus. Um, because what may be a good idea to you could be a horrible idea to everybody else. And the only way to validate that without wasting a lot of time and money building things that no one wants is to go find it. And then finally, once you have mapped out your business model very quickly, not spending a lot of time on it because it's not been tested yet. Going out, doing the customer discovery, that can take some time. Um, people ask, well, what, what's the right amount of time to do my quote unquote requirements analysis here? You'll know when you see the, the lights in their eyes too because they'll, they'll light up and say, you can do that, I want that. Great, that's your, that's your highest priority requirement or, or story in the backlog at that point. Then you go off and execute Agile. And they promote this, that it is agile engineering, agile execution, not, not the waterfall process that you go off and build this. Because you still need to keep the customer involved and you need to build pretty much, pretty much in front of the customer. When I was taking my um, 
product owner training a long time ago, uh, CSPO. One thing that I, I really latched on to was being a product owner is about 90% validation and 10% verification, right? Being a classically trained systems engineer, VMV, it said basically, why would you build or why would you make sure something worked if it wasn't what you wanted in the first place, right? And so extending that concept, lean startup is really about 99% validation and 1% verification. The way you do that is you iterate in front of the customer with true MVPs, true minimal viable products that um, could be paper prototypes. Right? It doesn't take much cost or, or time or money to draw on a piece of paper. Do you like this? Is this something you would buy? And iterate right in front of the customer that way. Or smoke tests. Um, fake landing pages. Um, I don't know if some of you have uh, clicked on some clicks, uh, Kickstarters or anything like that, where um, you go to buy it and it says, well, we'll put you on the, you know, the order page. You, know, you think you're getting ready to buy it, but then it says, it's not available yet, but we'll add you to our email list. All they're doing is a smoke test in front of you. They probably haven't even built the product yet. What they want to see through your actions, through your clicks, through your, that MVP, is their customer demand at all? And that's how they validate that before building the 1%, making sure that it's verified and built correctly. I want to talk about a friend of mine who is an analyst at NGA. Uh, very smart young lady, has come from, actually has a marketing degree, and was a very, worked in a very successful a pharmaceutical organization in pharmaceutical sales. So yes, she was a, an expert drug dealer. And she had this, this sense of service that she wanted to bring into the US government and, and quit that job uh, to be an analyst at NGA. You know, exemplary employee when she's there because she can hold ideas and concepts and abstract uh, analysis in her head um, that some people you know, will take a lifetime to master. And so, you know, she's, she's really applying a lot of those, those skills that she learned on the outside uh, in, inside of NGA. <laughs> However, um, she has what I would describe as an abusive relationship with her boss. Um, it's one of the most toxic work environments I've ever seen, inside or outside of the government. Uh, her boss will let her attend meetings outside of work. Her boss has commented on her characteristics her physical characteristics. Um, her boss has denied her from saying things in certain meetings. And if you think she, she had top cover above that, well, her her boss's boss also doesn't support any any of her appeals. In fact, it's, it's so institutional in her segment of NGA that uh, they, re they recently did an employee engagement survey and her branch that she's in had the lowest engagement score in the entire agency. However, being a brilliant young lady that she did, um, once NGA adopted this innovation framework of bringing Lean Startup into NGA where anyone can be an entrepreneur, she took advantage of that. And we'll talk, talk about Tara here a little bit later. This is uh, the Gartner hype cycle. Some of you may be familiar with this, where once a new technology comes out, Kind of starts there on the lower left. It's high visibility at the peak of inflated expectations, and shortly thereafter it falls into this trough of disillusion. But for those who, who persevere, we'll kind of come up through the slope of enlightenment to the plateau of productivity. Um, I, I, would, I would argue that probably Agile's about here, that we are kind of past the, the trough of disillusionment and kind of um, producing pretty well. Agile at scale. Would you, would you guys agree with that? You wouldn't agree with that? Okay, so how about Agile in government is right about, right about there, okay, in the trough of dissolution. Maybe Agile commercially, but not so much in the government service. I would argue that lean startup and innovation is right now at its peak of inflated expectations. Right? And it's, again, it's just a framework that's based on a lot of the same principles that Agile and lean are. And so, just like Agile was five years ago, with it being a buzzword, it's certainly riding, riding that wave right now. Just do a Google search for 
innovation or startup and government on the Google, and you'll find you know, 42 million records last time I checked. But we can use that to our advantage, especially learning all the lessons learned, especially what I've been trying to do for to, to try and introduce Agile to the government for the past seven years. Eric Ries, in this, the Lean Startup book, says there are five key principles to Lean Startup. He believes that entrepreneurs are everywhere, including inside of large organizations, and that entrepreneurship is a type of management, right? It's where you, if these are the people that are your, your out-of-the-box thinkers, your, your crazy kids that you know, want to go off and try new things. Great, we need a management framework that supports that as well. But you do that via validated learning. Again, this isn't just try anything and see if it works. We want to validate that our customers truly want the things we're building and not waste a lot of time or money doing it. We do that through an iterative, and I mean really quickly iterative, build, measure, learn. You build a little, you through MVPs, measure the response, and then get insight into what you should do next. For those who are familiar with Scrum, right? It's Scrum at a micro Get your plan, you execute, and then you just learn. Don't waste a lot of time. And the last concept that he doesn't cover very well in, in the Lean Startup book, and he covers only so-so in the, the startup way, is innovation account. If you haven't started yet, you have a good idea that's not been validated, how can you do cost schedule performance or earn value on an untested idea? So thus introduces the concept of innovation accounting, uh, taking a lot of leads from the uh, digital world of uh, e-commerce and online marketing and that kind of thing. Those same concepts um, being brought into a large organization need to be supported by that organization. Um, assuming the, the Lean Startup principles are true, how can that thrive in a large organization? It needs to have about four or five key things that enable innovation to grow inside an organization. The first one being space. You need room to grow. You need room for these, these crazy entrepreneurs to execute their, their good ideas. Uh, think of it as your Google 20% time. If you don't give them that flexibility and freedom, then you're just gonna squash every good idea and innovation's gonna die. You also need a methodology. For the third or fourth time, I'm gonna say, it's not just doing whatever you feel like. It is, it is. there are many methodologies, but pick one and make sure you're, you're executing on it. Um, so that it's measured, which goes into point number three. Metrics are, are key. These could be things like pirate metrics, uh, making sure you have technology readiness levels. Th those type of metrics can help you measure how well the organization, not just the entrepreneur, but how well the organization is executing on its innovation. Uh, next, resources. Um, NGA practices the golden rule. He who has the gold rules. <laughs> if you don't have funding, you can't get your thing built. And so we, you want to make sure that resources are being applied, not just money, but also time and, and manpower. You want to give people that flexibility to, to execute. Uh, oh, and by the way, don't fund it all up front and don't say, well, we'll put it in the pond. Right? We have to make sure we're incrementally resourcing things based off of data and making those um, as we said earlier, there's decisions to pivot or persevere because that way you can measure if, if a good idea is catching on and getting traction or if you just need to kill it. And all of these kind of summed up together and added in this, this culture piece. Yes, you've heard about culture for the past you know, day and a half, uh, but all those same things are also true for innovation, right? Link startup and innovation aren't just gonna come in and save the day from Agile. All those same values and principles are there. And you need to make sure that your culture institutionally supports innovation and lean startup. Here, here's one way to look at that. Um, this is an excerpt out of the startup way. The, the newer book from Eric Reese came out last year, where he outlines kind of how this works in large organizations. Uh, if you just kind of look at the top, bottom, and middle, you'll see a lot of the same values that any organization, especially ones that we're familiar with, um, would, would like to see from a foundational uh, shared values and outcomes and results perspective. But where things differ is on the left, you have your traditionalist, your general management. We're talking about return on investment, we're, we're looking at earned value, we're looking at 
Um, failure isn't an option, it has to work first, you know, the first time every time. But you'll see a lot of the same agile values and management techniques on the right. Some of the things that, that are different are things like um, focusing on a founder's mindset, focusing on those entrepreneurs inside your organization, let, give them that free, build, uh, the freedom and ability to execute. Um, the processes are not just iterative, they're highly iterative, scientifically measured um, processes that are full of rapid experiments. Remember, MVP is being experiments that even before you touch the first line of code. So I, I like this chart because it does show kind of a, the dichotomy of different um, horizons of innovation or, or you know, traditional organizations versus where we need to go. A lot of these same, uh, same rules apply for Agile as well. Well, as of about a year and a half ago, NGA decided to not only form an office of ventures and innovation, which was in itself a huge cultural shift, that it became its own standalone organization that was purely focused on innovation, which is a good best practice from Eric, Eric Reese's The Startup Play, right? Have that, who is that, that focal point for in, innovation inside of your, your agency? Um, but then shortly thereafter, adopted Steve Blank's innovation pipeline for the DoD and IC. If you don't have a way to promote these, these pet projects into your, your baseline, all these good ideas will die. They will not be care and fed through to mature into a, a real boy and become a real program. Um, what we've done is we've run this uh, almost two times with this, this innovation pipeline through a contest where we've had everyone, we've opened it up to the entire organization, um, tell us you know, some of your good ideas. That if, you don't have to be in the acquisition or the engineering shop. You, you could be an analyst on the floor and go through this. My friend Tara went through this as well. And what they did was they had an open competition over on the left, funneled some good ideas in, had a, a real quick lightweight criteria to um, funnel some, down select some of the good ideas into ones that were kind of near term executable. And then gave the employees the space. This was all signed off by their bosses and the boss's boss to make sure that we are letting so and so go off for a couple months into an accelerator program to learn startup techniques, to test this in front of um, other analysts and other people in their, their organization, and really get true data to work through their business model, work through customer discovery, and then use these MVPs and validated learning to eventually come to a Shark Tank-like board. Our next one will be June 20th, so um, where they will demonstrate in front of seniors with money, which is good, right? You gotta have resources. They'll demonstrate in front of seniors with resources in a Shark Tank-like environment where they do, their, they do a pitch, and they will say, here's, here's what we've learned, Here's um, where the original problem statement was. Here's where we came in. Uh, here's what we've validated or invalidated. And by the way, pivots are okay. We had one team come through that, that came with an idea. They knew it was the greatest idea in the world. Then when they went out and talked to 20 people in the first week, they said, we, we not only can't do it, we shouldn't do it. And threw that idea away. But said, we learned through those 20 people. They have this other problem we didn't even know. And we're going to go do that. That's what the entrepreneurial culture needs to, to flourish uh, through, through the organization. So after the Shark Tank type um, group comes, you have to come with an ask as well. We need, it's not percent share or equity share of your company, it's actually, we need, some, we need some more resources to help build this. We need some more time. We need, some, we need one developer for three weeks to help us prove this concept. That's, that's what they're asking for in this, this uh, Shark Tank uh, like board for, for NGA, and with the goal that it will eventually be incubated and either adopt, adapt it into the organization or might become its own, its own newly funded activity. So this does require some um, upfront uh, management reserve, if you will, for, to incrementally for, uh, resource this. So how did we do? In innovation thrives with five things. Space, yes, we gave those employees um, the top cover to go off and experiment. The methodology, when they came in through the accelerator, we taught them the lean startup process. 
as, as laid out by Steve Blank and Eric Reese. And this is how we're tracking and validating how they're, they're um, building their product in front of the customer. Metrics, still working on it um, because we want to make sure that there's kind of a consistent way to, to look at this. Um, but again, if, they, if they've talked to less than five people a week, they kind of said, you really aren't trying hard enough. Right? You, it's still your idea, not, not a validated idea. Um, resources, we are incrementally funding these things. Some of these things are, are going through non-traditional acquisition routes like OTAs and other um, type of um, small business set aside. So it's quicker to get through the acquisition process to pilot rather than be a full blown acquisition. And of course, by having this venture board, having the seniors dedicated, we have transformed the culture and it's, I'm surprised it happened as quickly as it did, right? Because this is, this is kind of a top down, you know, organizational level driven change. How are we doing? Uh, the things we've, we've learned so far on this process is that um, customer development is key. Hearing some of those teams that when they stop and, and reframe the problem, look at the problem again, that cost the government nothing but their time. Another thing that we're, we're pretty well is riding that wave, riding that, that hype curve right now. We need to show that it, we're trying to get out of the buzzword phase and into reality and really transform the government. Um, and we've proven we can move fast. We can get these things uh, adapted very quickly um, as pilots, but we still have a longer term conversation about how do we integrate into the baseline. Um, so if you get one takeaway from Lean Startup and government, it's really just realize that you're going to be wrong over and over again with your good ideas. So be wrong and achieve effects. And as for Tara, um, she went through the program, got uh, some funding for her project, uh, pivoted, uh, and adapt, you know, took, basically took away most of the unnecessary features and focused on a really core set of that. Uh, got a lot of exposure within the organization and eventually was able to leave the, uh, the toxic environment she was in as a new uh, new office. And it's like a night and day transformation when you see her uh, in the halls. Um, spirit's better and she's uplifting. And, and I just want that to be too. Is innovation is not just for innovation's sake. Just like agile innovation and lean startup is about people. And if you're not respecting people, and giving them the freedom that they deserve and the respect, then um, you could certainly transform the government for good. Thank you. <laughs> About 30 seconds, right? So, any questions? Yeah, so, uh, sure. Yeah, sure. So, um, for that structure, uh, it, it sounded like you were referring to kind of creating a separate innovation kind of like area with a board, right? So, so is that the way that it was structured to, to work? You created a new structure? Um, so I think I know where you're going with this. Um, having it as just the cool kids club over here um, is not how it was designed by, by design because um, those seniors who make up that board come from all of the other major line orgs inside of NGA. Um, so the, the breadth and depth of the exposure is not just limited to go over there and play in innovation land, we got work to do. Um, and so that was that was by design that it was uh, not just uh, owned by one organization or one office. That's a good question. Who else? Sure. Great. Um, I could go on about a four hour talk about innovation metrics, um, but the short answer is it's not cost of performance. Um, you want to uh, research a thing called Pirate Metrics uh, by David McClure, where he talks about how are you focusing on acquisition, activation, retention, referrals, and revenue, or in the government space, revenue being relevance. What are your utility metrics you're tracking through possibly some sort of BI tool to really measure? Are you getting the, the, the clicks, you know, the, the usage uh, to, to make sure you're using taxpayer dollars efficiently? Pirate R, because A A R R R, acquisition, activation, retention, referral, and uh, revenue spells R. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, up next, we have Daryl Anderson. 
Uh, Daryl Henderson is a strategic planning professional with over 30 years of experience in the government sector. Daryl has spent the first 26 years of his career in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, achieving the rank of Colonel. During his time in the Army, Daryl focused on allocation of resources for multi-billion dollar budgets to include United States Special Operations Command, USS OCOM. Daryl holds a PhD in Industrial and Systems Engineering from Virginia Tech, an MS from Stanford in Operations Research, and a Master's Degree in Strategic Studies from the U.S. Army War College.